welcome to the Black History Toolkit podcast with Abu Bakr Madan Al Shabazz. We at the ACC are passionate about celebrating Black history in Wales, so we're really thrilled to have Abu Bakr here today, who is an expert in the subject. So yeah, we're really pleased to have the opportunity to learn more about Welsh Black history. And without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Abu Bakr for his talk. And I'm Abu Bakr. My background, I'm a historian and I'm a social scientist. And one of the things I experience, well, what I'm experienced in or specialised in is the Black and African experience. And I look at it from a sociological as well as a psychological aspect, because I also have a psychotherapy um, background as well. I'm also a special educational needs tutor, as well as a professional uh, lecturer, teacher, etc. And I'm also an educational consultant for the Welsh Government of a new curriculum, hoping to integrate a multicultural curriculum throughout the whole of Wales by 2022. The talk which um, I've agreed upon doing today is looking at Black history in Wales, uh, contribution or loss. So we're just going to talk about the slave period now. So we're going to look at the likes of Henry Morgan, and Thomas Picton. We know about the controversy with Thomas Picton, where his image is in the universe uh, within the museum, and also it was in uh, City Hall in Cardiff. And we're just going to look at some of the background during the enslavement period, and it's linked to Wales because these individuals were Welsh. So if you look at the first person to come out on the scene, this is around about the Stuart period. So you're talking about Charles the First, uh, Charles the Second because the Caribbean islands don't get founded until about the times of King James after the Elizabethan period. This is important here. So you get the Elizabethan period, she dies, James I comes in, he becomes King of England and his sons, Charles I and Charles II, we know about Cromwell coming in between during the restoration, which is known as the restoration period when Charles II comes in. So it's all around this time that Britain ends up founding the so-called islands because Spanish, the Spanish were given the Caribbean islands, North America, Canada, Central America, as well as South America. So what happens now is that Britain, along with Holland, are going out and trying to ravage these things from the Portuguese and the Spanish. And they end up now taking some of the Caribbean islands. So it's approximately as early, I think it's about 1624. This is where St. Kitts was taken. In 1655, this is during the Cromwell, this is when Britain was a republic, this is when Jamaica is taken. And when they took over Ireland under Oliver Cromwell, those Irish prison of, uh, prisoners of wars were sent to Jamaica as indentured laborers, in, enslaved groups of people. And this is something I think that has been lost in the narrative, in the construction of the narrative in British society, where they will not really to some, to some extent acknowledge their enslavement by their own people. You have to understand that Europe and Britain went through almost a thousand years of feudalism. And the reason why feudalism fell was because a new type of exploitative feudalism came into, came into, uh, came into existence known as the transatlantic slave trade or the triangular trade. So this is Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan became the Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica. He was a pirate. He used to raid Spanish ships. He used to kill and burn ships, even with slaves on. He would steal the treasures of the Spanish, etc., and he became the governor. He became later Sir Henry Morgan. His family came on Newport and Cardiff. They had over 90,000 acres of land, this family. And he was stationed mainly part of his family in places like Rumney and Flan Rumney. So what is important to you see the you see the connection now between Wales directly with the Caribbean islands, with darker skinned people. And we also have evidence of darker skinned people living in what was known as Newport, you know, round about the 1600s, 1700s, which were taken from Africa directly into Wales. So now you have another migration of dark skinned people coming in to this country. So here, this is what was produced in Jamaica. So we know about rum, and one of the things I want to emphasize here is that I believe that the word rum is actually a connection to where Morgan, where this particular part of the Morgan family owned, Rumney and Flan Rumney. 
okay? He purchased land in Jamaica. I don't know who he's supposed to have uh, purchased it from because they killed off most of the native people. The Taino and the Arawak and the Caribs were killed off by the Spanish. So I don't know who he was supposed to purchase this land, over, land off. But the reality is that the plantation in which Henry Morgan himself had owned was called Clan Rumney. And this is what you will find. We have Cornwall and we have De Devon. We've got all these places in Jamaica. So what this actually shows is when a lot of the British people, the Welsh people, you know, went over to the Caribbean islands, they would place their names in certain areas to create towns and cities and villages and all these other type of things. So this is important for us to, 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 to understand of the intimate connections that the Welsh people had in when they were expanding with the British Empire now and exploiting and, and engaged in the exploitation of those particular people that were working underneath them, such as the slaves. So this is should be the house, okay, in Newport, et cetera. So we, we know that even though there are rich landowners of Morgan family, we know with uh, one of their family members, Sir Henry Morgan, who was Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica, this is during the time of Charles uh, II, that uh, um, there was a large, um, immense amount of wealth was being brought back to Wales. And a lot of that helped to create what was known as Newport Road, because all that was a village, that was like a forest back in the 1600s. Now we got roads, we got shopping, you got shopping malls, et cetera, on the side of the road, parts of a motorway, et cetera. All that is recent, all that is, all that is recent. So we need to understand the financial connections of Wales and where Wales itself had earned this money. Remember there was a, la a small black population coming into Wales, probably more in England and Scotland, but a very small population in Wales. And that's a young and older, Pirate Henry Morgan. So let's have a look at the ironworks of Wales and how that feeds into the Caribbean islands. So this is known as the Kafatha Ironworks in Merthyr Tydfil, and this actually was um, this actually was brought about around about the 1700s. And these are the sort of things which they were creating, you know, to go on the ankles of slaves. So that's Wales's involvement within the slave trade. And the ironworks, which was probably one of the most, which was, was most profitable out of all ironworks within the UK, or one of the most popular. There was a time where um, Merthyr Tydfil's iron was far more powerful and hegemony and had monopoly over other types of iron. So Anthony Bacon is one of the founders of this, uh, of this mining um, company. Here is the, I think this was actually found and it's supposed to have the stamp apparently, it's supposed to have the stamp of Merthyr Tydfil on here. And these are the sort of instruments which they were making, you know, to put on the slaves, to capture slaves, et cetera. So this is Wales's involvement, direct involvement with the slave trades and with the Welsh economy. One of the leading ironmongers of the 18th century, Anthony Bacon, was intimately connected to the triangular trade. In 1765, he set up his ironworks at Merthyr Tydfil, which expanded rapidly owing to government contracts during the American Civil War. This means that Wales was funding yeah, okay, the British at this time, you know, against the so-called American Revolution in 1776. But what also needs to be realized, approximately 100 years later, when the American Civil War takes place, Britain or Wales was still selling cannons and cannonballs to the Confederate States, even though they were supposed to abolish the slave trade in 1807 and the abolition of slavery, the slave system in 1833. We still see their participation in slavery where the economy is concerned in North America. So this is a contradiction. The abolition movement in Wales were very successful to a large extent in the abolition of slavery. But we see ironworks and copper works coming out to Swansea and all these different metallurgical industries within Wales feeding into the military of the civil war that takes place in America. And they were supporting the Confederate States, which means that Wales directly was supporting slavery even though they're supposed to have helped to have abolished it in the Caribbean islands some 30 years before. 
So he also goes on to say about the, the Kefatha um, furnaces, et cetera. The Bacon made his fortune out of the artillery contracts. They were building weapons. Weapons were being built in places like Merthyr Tidville. Even in, if you go to places like uh, Swansea with the copper, et cetera, some of these were torture instruments which they were making for the so-called slaves. Things around their neck to stop them from sleeping, things to cover their mouth, some from eating. Sometimes these things were put on their face because the sun was so hot it would burn off the skin. So these are just factors we need to understand of its involvement, Wills' involvement with the so-called Caribbean islands. Then we have the likes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, whose family originally came from the area around Snowdonia in Gwinnett, was much taken with the idea of Welsh-speaking Indians. So Thomas Jefferson is from a Welsh family. We even know during the Confederate States, when that emerged, when they seceded from the so-called Union during the time of Abraham Lincoln. What we do know is that Jefferson Davis was also from a Welsh family. He was the head of the Confederate States. So we have a lot of Welsh involvement, not just in the Caribbean islands, but also in North America. So this is the likes of Picton. This is a controversy of his image or this statue, which was in City Hall. He was Lieutenant Governor uh, General of uh, the island of Trinidad, and he was a brutal individual. He used to torture the slaves that work underneath him. There was even evidence of him raping women underneath him. And he was admired by the Welsh people. OK, and they built a statue and put portraits of him and because of his greatness, so-called in the Battle of Waterloo, he's the highest ranking general in the Battle of Waterloo that died in this particular battle. So these are some of the con controversial issues between the black community and the Welsh community as far as who is heroes and sheroes and what constitute them to become heroes. Do we overlook the atrocities that these individuals engaged in? So some of the atrocities is with this young girl here, okay, Louisa Cauldron. This is a girl who's supposed to have stolen something, etc., and picked him himself. Was involved of uh, was involved in horrific torture of this young woman, horrific torture, and he was glamorized by the Welsh people, where images is painted of him and statues are made of this individual. Now he used to keep comfort girls as young as 11 years of age, who became his mistresses. Henry Morgan was no different. So the reality is we need to look at the sinister behavior of many of these individuals in the Caribbean islands, which is sometimes overlooked by historians when they want to erect these statues and these portraits of these individuals because uh, his, uh, his slavery was a horrific system of exploitation, social degradation and all types of things that you can think of. And the mere fact of putting up these statues and images of these people, these are unfair contingencies, deceitful maneuvers, and these are false pretenses that people that lead in the next generation into accepting. We cannot accept these people. They may have done something, and because of the booty they may have had, they may have contributed some sort of bribery to the states or to the monarchy or to whatever leading party was involved. That doesn't mean we should overlook the atrocities that these people did because they made, they made an amount, a large amount of wealth from the exploitation of people. And the exploitation of people meant they were not good slave owners and good slave masters. They didn't free people. We know what, look, we know what took place with the statue of Colston in Bristol. The people have been arguing about that. You know, under this, you know, the man was part of an organization, a Royal African Company, during its existence, where over 19,000 black souls was lost. And they've erected something of this man. They've had a school named after him and all these other type of things. No one talks about the rape and the pillars that this man engaged in. And he's supposed to be a local hero because he gave his dirty money to the city in order to build it. This is no different to drug dealers giving their money to politicians to build things. It's filthy, dirty money, and we have to acknowledge that. Where's a moral mind and compass of a people when these things actually happen? So we have to acknowledge what these people did. They did very little 
to help even their own people, the so-called working class of this country. It was mainly the middle class and the aristocracy who they gave these briberies to where these images became erected. So these are some of the things I want you to understand looking at the likes of Picton, we looked at the likes of Henry Morgan, what type of atrocities they themselves engaged in and the amount of darker skinned people which would have accompanied them when they returned to Wales. So all I'm trying to show you here is the different types of people that migrated over time to this country. And you, you, you know, you're totally right. You know, I know I've, I've, I've talked about, and I did say I'm going to talk about 50,000 years within an hour, you know. And like I said, if people have been there from the beginning of time, is looking for those distinct connections uh, which has taken place, especially within the British Isles, and to show that we have more similarities and differences. And this is why I said, not just in you know, not just in culture, but also through marriage, amalgamation, you know, the mixing of races from a cultural or from a biological perspective. And knowing all that some of that information has been lost over time through, you know, the disappearance of language. Like I said, the Welsh people are losing their language. So they lost a lot of good wholesome information there's still bits within the welsh language which talks about the african or the black presence it, it is there and i do have the references you know also with the english coming over as invaders they were trying to wipe away the celtic you know narratives and come with their own narratives as well you know but just to answer your question, you know, I know it wasn't a question, it was a statement. There is interconnections. I tried to bring that about in order to show that we are more um, connected to this land than we realize. And for people from, from the Welsh community to realize, you know, that multiculturalism in this society didn't just come through the First World War, Second World War. It's been here from the beginning of time. And there was no problems with it until around about 1600s. You know. Yeah, so thanks ever so much, Abba. That was incredible. Brilliant, um, brilliant. Yeah, it's given me a lot to think well, about. And it was, it was thank great. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, I really appreciate the good turnout. Um, thanks everyone, have an incredible weekend. Thank you.